There are plenty of Enlist E3 soybeans, but these beans are turbocharged with elite germplasm for greater performance. So when harvest comes, your yields are off to the races. Introducing Pioneer brand A-Series Enlist E3 soybeans with exclusive high-performing DNA like no other. This episode of Real Ag Radio is brought to you by Ag Expert. Go from field to farm with Canada's most trusted, most secure farm management software. Ag Expert keeps you on top of it all, no matter where you are. Get started for free at agexpert.ca. It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Real Ag Radio and realagriculture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Thursday edition of the show. Hey, thanks so much for making Real Ag Radio and, of course, Rural Radio 147 a part of your work day. And a big shout out as well to everybody listening out there on the Real Ag Radio podcast, no matter where you are farming in the world. It's for Rapid Fire today, which is brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada. You know, for more than 90 years, Pioneer has developed and tested products to meet your local challenges. With new Optimum Glide Canola, Enlist E3 Soybeans, you're like to performing corn products and industry-leading traits and technologies to maximize your yield potential, Pioneer's on-the-ground teams can help you get the right products for your fields. Visit pioneer.com slash Canada to learn more. And uh, we'll be joined today by Mike Weir. We're going to find out what's happening in his territory in Manitoba. We're also going to hear today from farmers from uh, Nova Scotia. We've got Ryan McCarran. He's from Nova Scotia. We've got Kennedy Kaufman from uh, Ontario. Corey Leeson from Saskatchewan. And Kevin Bishop. He is from Chilliwack, British Columbia. So we are truly coast to coast today. So it's going to be a lot of fun. If you have any feedback on today's show, send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also call the Real Ag Feedback Line, 855-776-6147. This week's question to the farmers will be all about do you agree with the canadian decision the canadian government's decision to basically exile send back to china the chinese ambassador based on some interference that's been happening in canada a pretty serious situation was that the right move you let us know and we'll ask the farmers here as well It is time for today's product spotlight. Joining me on the line is Roger Gunning with US Borax. So what's something that growers in North America don't necessarily think about when it comes to their fertilizer? There could be heavy metals like arsenic and fertilizers that have not gone through the stringent refining process. It is well known that arsenic can be toxic to plants as well as animals. If you, know, if you have a high level of arsenic in your fertilizer and you, you don't know it, it will accumulate in the soil and then it'll be taken up in your crops. Refined borates, like those we sell here at US Borax, go through a seven step process to help ensure at the end our product is pure. How then can, can growers get more information if they want to know more about US Borax? Definitely take a look at our website, agriculture.borax.com, or give me a phone call, 773 923 7420. All right, Roger, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Did you know that Pioneer now has a full lineup of Enlist E3 soybeans? Take a look at Pioneer brand Enlist E3 soybeans for the highest yield potential and for the best agronomic package and herbicide trade options. From the lab to the field, Pioneer brand Enlist E3 soybeans are the best in beans, period. Ask your local Pioneer representative about Enlist E3 Beans. The Farmer Rapid Fire on Real Ag Radio, of course, is brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada. Make sure you visit pioneer.com slash Canada to learn about all of their great products and technologies that they have to offer the Canadian marketplace. And for all of our U.S. listeners, go to pioneer.com. 
And we start off this week's Farmer Rapid Fire in Enigadish, Nova Scotia, a place I've always wanted to visit. I, I would love to go to Nova Scotia. We're talking to Ryan McCarran. Hey, Ryan, how are you doing? Not too bad, Sean. How are you? Pretty good. Okay, if I was going to come to Enigadish, what would be the biggest reason I would do so? What what What, what is there to see there? Oh, I guess in the middle of summer, it'd be probably the best time. There's the Highland Games, which is a big Scottish heritage festival. Lots of bagpipes and stuff, if you're into that. I'm lots not of, really into that. A lot, uh, lot of Guinness. No, not as much as you think it would be. It's all just Coors Light, Molson, and whatever you get at the beer tent. But there's lots of good live music and lots of uh, there's lots of drinks to be had. And then we've got lots of beaches and lots of stuff right on the uh, the Northumberland Strait, so yeah, there's lots of scenery that way to see. Nice. Coors Light doesn't sound very Scottish. I, I... no, it it doesn't, does it? No, it doesn't. <laughs> you get. Yeah, I'm I'm sure you can still get Keith. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. It, it, I, I, you you think there'd be like some Kilkenny or something that would sort of yeah. feel a little bit yeah. more Scottish and proper when we talk mm. about uh, the Highland Games? Okay. What's happening on the farm this week? Oh, uh, just trying to plant, seed, plant, and put fertilizer out, just kind of full tilt, calving, bowling, everything. <laughs> full full throttle. It's that time of yeah. the year. Yeah. And we like to do it all at once, it seems, because, I don't know, we're suckers for punishment. How, how, do you, how do you manage all that? Like, you're trying to figure out the priorities for the day when you're trying to get all of that done. Well, just kind of see what happens. They don't really try to make too many hard plans anymore because that's a good way for them to fail. So we just kind of get up, and if things are good in the field and we can get going, then we'll head that way. If we get rained out, we'll we'll uh, go back and work cattle if we have to. Mm. Like most of our stuff, we're putting our cows out on pasture now or in some cabin ground. So, I mean, nine times out of ten, they just kind of take care of themselves, and we kind of run it that if they can't, really take care of that calf itself or something happens and we really don't want them here working anyway. So yeah. we're kind of running that school. Like, I mean, obviously we'll still treat them if there's something to be treated, but, but this time of year when things are greening up and it's a bit of a cleaner environment, you usually don't have that problem unless like a cold front moved in, but nine times out of 10, we're kind of past that real bad weather. So you get less issues. Like uh, calving outside. Yeah. So what, what's kind of your marketing plan for your beef operation? Are you taking to well, a certain last, weight or what are you doing? Well, the last couple of years we transitioned to taking on its own cow calf right to finish. So now we have all of our cows and whatever we finish on farm, we'll take them to Atlantic Beef Products or we'll sell to our own freezer on farm for the local market. Hmm. How, how has so, that been? Has that been pretty good? Yeah, that has been good. It's been really good. We're starting to get a good brand built with our ranch and what we put on social media and, and on Instagram. And Yeah. We're going to have some fun with it, and we are close to a, a pretty good-sized town. Like The town of Ankenish is about 5,000, 6,000 people, and the wider county is 20,000. So we got lots of marketing opportunities right there in our local area. Well, give yourself a product drop. What, what, what are we calling the, the product? What's the name? Uh, South River Ranch Beef. South River Ranch Beef. There you go. Okay, yeah, that's, that's, the Instagram, that's the Instagram handle in case anyone wants to come, come follow us. Nice. I like it. Okay. Yeah. And are, so are you finishing on grass or are you putting them in a, are you finishing them in a yard? No, we finish them in our yard. We converted one of our old heifer barns into a, into a feed lot. So like we do, we, we sell it as grass raised grain finish. So, I mean, they will get like 70% of their ration will still be forage, uh, grass forage. And then we finish them usually on barley. Mm, okay. Usually make them so they get 20 pounds of barley because we do have a lot of smaller beef producers in this area and they're all selling grass fed. So we're just trying to offer like a different, a, a different taste for the local market that they're not normally used to, which would be a more traditional way of finishing beef. And yeah. the other reason why we do that is because we are still selling our excess to Atlantic beef products where we're still going to get put on the grading system on a grid. So we still want to be able to make triple A and prime if we can, because yeah that's the incentive for us. So we said, we try to play to our strengths on our operation and we had the grain and we had uh, the livestock and the cattle to kind of do it the way that another person selling local might not have the, the ability to. So from a cropping perspective, what's in the crop mix? Uh, barley, corn, and then we grow alfalfa and we have a lot of hay. Acres. Okay. So yeah. how, how are things progressing from that aspect? 
Oh, good. We're getting lots of stuff on the ground. Uh, barley, like it's been a dry spring out here so so far. We had a big thunderstorm rolling uh, maybe two days ago. So that kind of gave us a lot of moisture. Maybe has us off the field for a day or two, but we expect to be back into it going now. Like corn, we don't be really starting right now. Some guys in more central Nova Scotia, the Valley, have got rolling on corn, but we're a little further north, so we don't even really be starting to think about it now on a normal year anyway so yeah we're still pretty much right where we want to be so based on your understanding because we we've heard here the last couple weeks from maritime farmers that have joined us it's it's kind of dry is that is that pretty much widespread across the the whole atlantic canada geography or some areas better than do do you know that yeah yeah no i have been listening and yeah we've been hearing that a lot like as far as us on our side or our section of the Maritimes, like we have a lot of heavier soils, a lot more clays and stuff. So like we get a dry spring, it actually works better for us. Whereas guys in the valley or in PEI would be more on sand or lighter soils. Like it hurts them a lot more than it affects us. Not saying that we don't get that dry. The point we were definitely happy to get the moisture to get the forage and the grasslands going. But uh, yeah, no, it has been a widespread dry spring as uh, so far, which yeah. is. I don't know we be one time says we kind of want a drought in the spring just as long as it doesn't keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, eventually in it's our, in rain. our section of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's eventually it's got to rain. Um, it, from uh, in Nova Scotia, is the beef industry vibrant right now? Like, or or are you kind of uh, a very unique situation? Well, or? yeah, no. Like, it's the beef industry in Nova Scotia has never really recovered from. The Maritimes really has never recovered from BFC. Yeah. So, like, there is a few producers of us, but, I mean, not nearly what it was whenever uh, pre-2003. Like, it's just never come back, and people really don't have the – trying to get young people into it or that mindset of, well, you know, if there's older guys and the prices come up, they're looking at saying, well, this is my time to kind of get out. And there's not really a whole lot of young farmers that are coming up that can say, we're going to get ourselves a couple hundred head of beef and – yeah, and get back into this industry, and they kind of have that mindset too, right? Like a lot of people are saying, like, "Oh, there's no money in beef," but they're not really doing the numbers. It's just kind of, it's just kind of what they they hear what the neighbor says, and then they just don't really try. So that kind of part is frustrating because there is lots of opportunities down here, and generally grow lots of grass. But yeah, no, no, you can't, doubt. You can't force them to do it. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the hangovers, the hangover of BSC continues. I, I hear you on that one. Okay. Oh yeah. Hey, this week's question has to do with what, what? What's your opinion on what Canada, the decision that Canada made in terms of expelling the Chinese ambassador back to China? Do you think that was a good move? What do you think? Yeah, I think it could have happened a little sooner. <laughs> to be honest, like uh, I get they're a pretty important trade uh, partner for us for a lot of our crops out west at the same point it's kind of ridiculous how long it takes for them to uh you know show any kind of an answer on that on that front yeah so my official answer was it didn't happen soon enough appreciate your thoughts and opinions on that uh for for sure hey ryan have yourself a great day all the best to you during the spring season here and we'll check in with you a little bit later as the months progress okay no i appreciate it sean thanks for calling we got the update from Atlantic Canada. Next, we're going to go into southwestern Ontario and find out how Kennedy Kaufman is making out. You're listening to Real Life Radio. It's the Farmer Rapid Fire, brought to you today, of course, by Pioneer Seeds Canada. As you head out into the field this season, the Corn School's got you covered. Everything from tillage discussions, weed control info, field trial results, yield strategies, and more. The Corn School on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed. Brought to you by Pride Seeds and BASF. Corn School episodes are available at cornschool.com, from realagriculture.com, or as a podcast from your favorite streaming service. Download the latest episode today. It's now time for a product spotlight, uh, all about the Pest and Predator podcast, brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grain Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. Joining me right now is Dr. John Givlosky. He's an entomologist with Manitoba Agriculture. Okay, we've got another season of the Pest and Predator podcast. John, what, what is the Pest and Predator podcast, and what can listeners expect in what I can't believe is going to be season four? Yeah, it's a series of interviews with entomologists from across the prairies. 
And we're talking about pests and predators that are common in Western Canada. And what we'll be doing is we'll be bringing you the latest information on pests that you may encounter in your fields and the beneficials that help to control them. And with each episode, we feature a different entomologist on a different topic. Um, listeners will also learn about uh, the role that beneficial insects can play in their fields and ways that we can protect them and some scouting tips. When you think about Pioneer Seeds Canada, you got to consider, like, think about the technologies. Optimum Glide, Canola, Enlist E3 Soybeans. That's just naming a few, right? So go to pioneer.com slash Canada to learn more. Of course, Pioneer Seeds Canada is the sponsor of the Farmer Rapid Fire. Great to have Pioneer Seeds Canada aboard, supporting Canada's only national ag radio program. And we take the Farmer Rapid Fire into Woodstock, Ontario, and we're talking to Kennedy Kaufman. Kennedy, welcome back to the show. Yeah, how are you doing, Sean? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. I, I can't complain. How about you? No, it's nice weather finally here. The sun's shining and it's warm and people are starting to get on the field, so it's a good feeling. Yeah, and it sounds like you're out in the field right now. Yeah, yeah what- we're just... Uh, planting corn today and getting prepared to plant some processing peas tomorrow and and the next day most likely so yeah nice. everything's starting to move along okay now is your uh, do you get to, do you get some seat time in the planter then is that what you're doing yeah i usually run the uh, air seeder uh just out this morning uh, working up ground and picking rocks and all sorts of different stuff going on how many people are are working right now in the operation? Um, about eleven today. Oh, okay. Well, so organizing all those people and who's going to take care of what—that's uh, definitely a, a, a an important task. Yeah, it's uh, probably one of the more important jobs on the farm. But uh, seems like uh, everything kind of just tickety boo most years. Yep. And any any changes to the crop rotation this year? Uh, no, we're sticking pretty uh, pretty solid with our rotation this year. So what what's in there? Corn, beans, wheat, uh, processing peas? Corn, um, soybeans, IP soybeans, uh, edible beans, mostly cranberries, um, soy beans, sweet corn, and uh, winter wheat. Oh, that, that's that's enough to manage. There's there's a lot there of uh, trying to make all make all that uh, happen. Uh, how, how, how's the soil? Are you, do you feel pretty good about uh, how things are looking early on here in May? Um, the last couple of days, Sean, it hasn't been working up the greatest. And uh, I think it's just because it was, we had a cold rain for about seven days. And I think just underneath, you know, the ground is saturated. Or it, it, it's hard enough underneath. So it's, the last couple of days worked up a little bit chunky, a little marbly, but uh, today I find it's working up a bit better. It's about 23, 24 degrees here, so a couple of nice warm days will uh, definitely make it work up a little more mellow. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is a busy time of the year, right? We're we're kind of going flat out. We're when the days are good, we're trying to get done what we can. Um, we can kind of burn the candle a little bit at both ends. How, how do you manage your pace? during this time of the year? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of a tricky one. Sometimes it's slow and steady always wins the race. Uh, no point getting in a rush and racking stuff or getting hurt. So if you just uh, just go at a nice steady pace, it seems like everything gets done uh, every year. So no point getting too worked up about it. Yeah, when, when it comes to planting, do, do you... How do you manage the hours? Like, will you will you will you guys just really really work long hours in the days that you can, or do you more meter it out where it's like, hey, you know what, we're we're gonna get it done. It's just a case of when. Like, how do you manage that? Uh, uh with the calendar the way it is right now, we'll have to just get her done because we'll want to get that corn planter switched over to plant edible beans at the end of May. So yeah, it'll just be a crunch to get her done at this point. You can never drink too much caffeine and naps when you can, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. you, when you're in the when you're not talking to us here like you are right now, uh, do you keep a quiet cab or do you tend to listen to the radio? Oh, I usually listen to the radio about 
change the station about every three minutes because my attention span isn't very good. So tonight I'll probably listen to AM radio to see if the uh, see if the Leafs can uh, if they're going Dolphin or if they're going to play another game. Yeah, the, the, I I I really like. I, I've said it on the show before. Like I I really really enjoy listening to baseball on the radio. Yeah, um, I, I just find it so relaxing. Like I yeah I enjoy yeah it. I like. I love listening to hockey on the radio too. It just seems better listening to the radio, I guess. I find listening to music. I enjoy listening to hockey at night when it's on. Yeah, that would be the fan five ninety for you. Uh, yeah, five ninety or twelve ninety. Okay. Okay. So there's a couple options. You're lucky. See, you're just lucky. You're lucky. We don't. We, you know, a lot. A lot of us out here in the West get like one station, maybe if we're lucky. And I can. I can even listen to junior hockey, the London Knights on AM nine eighty two. Oh, well, there you go. E- even even better. Uh, how do yeah. you fe- how do you feel from a level of optimism about the year ahead? You you, you thinking this uh, this year is going? You know, twenty one was pretty good in Ontario. Twenty two produced a pretty good crop. Um, what, what about uh, what about the year ahead? You feeling pretty optimistic? Yeah, I think uh, I think you know everyone's uh, getting some. Uh, for more fertilizer on in their program with a little bit lower prices this year. So, uh, and, um, the winter was a little difficult. Like we never really had a lot of frost. So it's, uh, it's, that'll cause the ground to work up a little bit different, but uh, I think that, uh, 23 will be a good year. You can always hope, right? Yeah. Well, I, I think so. You, you got to have that level of the level of optimism going into the season. Like if you're feeling, really pessimistic about it that it's you know it, it, it's a long year right so yep. i think at this point you got to kind of look at it and definitely if you look in southwest ontario there's a pretty good track record of some pretty good crops here the past few years so um that that's got to be taken as a bit of a positive single or signal as well right so yep. um yeah because it you know trying to sort out the markets, for example, is a little bit tough. We kind of bounced around and, you know, there's, uh, we heard on the show yesterday talking about some of the geopolitical influences and how, you know, in some cases it's, it's good to understand what China's doing or what's going on in Ukraine with that black sea grain deal. But at the same time, you can't control it. So you got to focus, the th- you got to focus on the things that you can control to kind of lower your stress level a little bit. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And I think like, there's a lot more to the grain markets than what the USDA report will say, right? Like there's a lot of uh, other economic factors that uh, I'd rather watch closer than the grain prices. So, mm. Hey, th- this week's question of the week, uh, I'm curious if, uh, do you agree that Canada should uh, excuse or boot out the Chinese ambassador based on the interference that was found out rela- relative to uh, MP Michael Chong. What are your thoughts? Did Canada make the right move there? He should definitely be gone. Yeah. Uh, so give, give me a little bit more there. What, why do you, why do you think that? I just, I don't think we should have too close of a relationship with anyone that has anything to do with China. Just based on some of their beliefs and some of their behaviors? Yeah. It's just kind of a tough time in the world right now to pick sides with people, right? Mm. Yeah, it, it is It is that for sure. Absolutely. Hey, Kennedy, thanks so much for joining us here today on Real Ag Radio. Really appreciate it, and we'll chat with you again soon, okay? Yeah, thanks, John. Have a great day. When we come back on the Farmer Rapid Fire, we will leave the east and we're going to head west uh, onto the prairies next. You're listening to Real Ag Radio for the Farmer Rapid Fire, brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada. Join us for the Canadian Beef Industry Conference, August 15th to 17th at Calgary, Alberta. Spend time networking on the trade show floor, hear from keynote speakers, take in breakout sessions designed to increase profit, manage your rangeland, and navigate trends. Get up close to advanced techniques and hands-on demos, and experience bullfighting at the closing party. Proud, innovative, and loyal, we are beef. Registration is now open. Visit CanadianBeefIndustryConference.com for full details and to register. Whether you're seeding, harvesting, or anything in between, the Wheat School on RealAgriculture.com has you covered. 
timely agronomic information from industry experts available online anytime. Give your wheat crop a good start and a great finish with The Wheat School on realagriculture.com. Brought to you by CNM Seeds, Syngenta Canada and the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio and the Farmer Rapid Fire here today on this Thursday. You know, Pioneer for 90 years, for 90 years, has industry-leading traits and technologies to maximize your yield potential. Pioneer's on-the-ground team can help you get the right products for your field. Your field. Not just the like, not just your neighbor's field, but your field. Visit pioneer.com slash Canada to learn more. And we take the farmer rapid fire into the depths of Saskatchewan. And we're talking, I don't know why it's the depths, but anyway, we're, we're in Radisson, Saskatchewan. And we're talking to Corey Leeson. Hey, Corey, how are you doing? Hey, Sean, I'm doing well. Yeah, it's a kind of the depths, I guess. We're kind of north central, uh, north of the North Saskatchewan River, kind of yeah. well, well into Saskatchewan, typical okay. Saskatchewan. Okay, that's a good description. Then. It depends which direction you're coming from, how deep it is, I guess. But um, yeah, hey, yeah. Ha- how's uh, how are things going on the farm? Have we started putting some seed in the ground? Oh, gosh. We're, yeah, we're well along. We're on crop number four, which is not reflective of acres necessarily because we have a mix of crops. But we're, uh, oh, 40% done or something like that. Not hurrying either. Like just kind of going along and Crops going in the ground, so we're well along for this time of year. So that tells me, I, I'm my spidey senses then are telling me that you are on the dry side. Yes, yes. I'm keep hoping for a rain delay. It, it would have to be a really big rain to even be much of a delay, but it is dry. Um, we had a little rain in April, like maybe a half an inch or something somewhere in April, and then Really, nothing in May and and some warm, windy weather. So it's dry. Yep, no question about it. I think Palliser should have come a little bit further north, maybe when he was snooping around. But um, I, yeah, I mean, we're hopeful it's going to rain. But but it, so far, uh, rain has not been a uh, not been coming our way. Any changes to the crop mix because of some of those conditions, or full steam ahead with what you intended? Um, more or less what we intended. I, I mean, we're using less fertilizer, particularly nitrogen this year. So that's a reflection of the, of the last couple of dry seasons. We did soil testing last fall. We also did some of the uh, PRS probe testing this spring. And, and we've got a fair bit of nitrogen in the ground. So we're going lighter. Um, so that's, you know, carryover plus, plus prospect of the soil dry profile. So that's kind of different. Um, but other than that, oh, well, the other thing, I, like I like doing something new every year. So with this year, which isn't new necessarily, so we, we planted some Durham. We, I've never grown Durham before, but you know, you go south and there, it's just it's lots of Durham. So it's not it's not a new crop or anything, just, but it's new for me. So we're, we're doing that because I like trying something new. And last year we had yellow mustard in, and it turned out awesome, mm. even though it hardly rained last year. But so we've got Durham on on one dryland quarter and on our only irrigated quarter. So that'll be something interesting to keep uh, keep it spicy here on in Madison. Yeah, you're kind of a little bit north of that traditional Durham growing. You know, you you you're, you, you feel like you're living in the Palliser Triangle. So now you're going to farm like it. That's yeah. I'm going to tempt fate. <laughs> like if that doesn't make it rain, what what else can we? So we've got lentils in, and and then now this Durham. And uh, I, I'm not going to say I'm a Durham grower. I'm a Durham planter right now because I've got it in the ground. But we'll see how it goes come fall. Um, so yeah, and then then like the irrigation is just a almost a hobby for us. But it's an area that we've been looking at again. I mean that system we have was put up in 1985, mainly to grow forage for livestock at that time. Mm-hmm. And we have more development potential. And of course, when it gets dry, you start thinking, oh, well, maybe that's the route we should be going. And so we are looking into that. Um, I don't know how far we'll get or what, if that's the right direction necessarily. There's a lot of factors and, and a lot of money, of course. But yeah. but it's an interesting thing. And, and uh, I like I like irrigation, so if my son likes it, well, maybe that's the way we should go. 
Yeah, it definitely does open up. You know, <laughs> there's like a misconception out there where people are like, oh, if you got irrigation, life's easy. You're you just got different. Mm. You just got different problems, right? <laughs> but it, right, but yeah, it, sure, yep. But it does yep. take away one, and in in you, you felt this for the past couple of years is like in times of drought, it, it alleviates that that issue for you, right? So it, right, yes, yeah, it, it adds a whole bunch of work. There's no question about that, and 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 you know you've got to be around and you you're doing other stuff, um, but it does open up possibilities. So. I think it's certainly worth looking at again. Um, our our system, like we're one of the few groundwater irrigation systems in Saskatchewan, I believe, mm. and and so we've kind of got a unique situation that, that I think could be developed. But uh, yeah, we're just we're we're looking at that, and, and maybe that'll happen. We'll see. Yeah. Now I can't remember d- canola in the rotation. Yep. Yeah, we uh, we've been seeding canola last of the crops. So we're on hard red wheat right now, and then then we'll just have canola after that. Um, kind of a moderate amount. We try to keep it about twenty five percent of our acres. Yeah, don't get too too aggressive. You, you've you've been you know with things like a phytomyces and peas. You you know about uh, the rotation stretching and some of the benefits. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And and we have had to. We're really cautious on our pulse rotation. I mean, most of our fields have had pulses every four years for quite some time so yeah it's something we've really we're conscious of and we're stretching it up to six on on some fields yeah. probably should be going maybe even longer um wow. but uh yeah it's that's another factor for sure on the canola have you, in the past couple of years have you had a lot of flea beetle pressure last year there was a little bit um not not a lot. I wouldn't say a lot. We we certainly have striped flea beetles now more prevalent than crucifer. Um, so last year, actually, we uh, we did spray a little bit, uh, and on, well, we did spray one whole field, and then we sprayed the perimeter of a couple more, but it wasn't severe. Um, that we earlier seeded canola around here has been challenged with flea beetle pressure, and so we've kind of back that off by a few days and it seems to help. I don't say it's the right thing all the time necessarily, but it seems to have worked for us to sort of help it through that period of time. Yeah. Now coming up here in a little right away here on the show, we've got Mike Weir, not the golfer, the agronomist with, with Pioneer Seeds Canada. He is, although I would have a lot of questions for Mike Weir, the golfer. Um, Mike Weir, the agronomist with Pioneer Seeds Canada is going to be on the show here a little bit. When it comes to canola, do you have a, do you have a question that I should be asking him from an agronomic perspective on canola that's kind of uh, on your mind? Hmm, good question. Well, you know, that the seed, the timing issue would be something to ask, I think. Um, Maybe, maybe also around around seed treatments. Like, where is, does he have some some knowledge about what's coming? Is there something better coming? Particularly something that's going to work better on striped flea beetles. Yeah. You know, that, I think that that's still the the direction that we need to go. I mean, foliar spraying is not the answer. It's not the way to go. You can't get it done in time necessarily. It's a hassle. It's it's not environmentally the best thing. So we need a, a good flea beetle, or pardon me, a good seed treatment package. And so that'd be one. The other thing, of course, that we're hearing about with canola is, is uh, verticillium. Or vert- I forget how you say it exactly. Verticillium. Vert- yeah, there you go. There you go. Yep. Yeah. And I think we did see a bit of that last year. Um, so that's a that's sort of a rising concern. Is it how bad is that going to become? You know, if it's around a little bit, is it going to keep getting worse? That sort of thing. And I know seed seed companies are just starting to sort of assess varieties in, in terms of resistance, um, levels of resistance. So that we'll we'll learn more as as time goes on. But that's another canola issue, I guess, yeah. that could come around. You know, the thing, Corey, when you're looking at any of these crops, we we're really good at coming up with. Like the the next problem, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. That's right. I, 
Often that it seems like that's what you do is look for problems, right? <laughs> something comes up, and then oh, something else, and yeah, not not just with the crops, but machinery and and all kinds of things. Yeah, <laughs> you're good at looking at problems. And, I hear you. And, hey, th- this week I'm asking everybody their their opinion on you know, no one's a geopolitical expert, but I'm just curious what farmers think because farmers could be impacted. Uh, Canada has decided to ship the Chinese ambassador back to China based on these, uh, mm-hmm. this issue with this interference. Do you think that's a good decision? Well, uh, not, not, not considering farm. Yes, I, I do think it's a good decision. Now factoring in farm in terms of exports and so on. Well, then there's, certainly there's a concern there. We yellow peas have almost exclusively been going to China for a number of years. Uh, canola, of course, big market. So the market concerns are on some of our commodities and, and what is going to happen. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a concern. No question. I think the, the other side of that though is typically they seem to need the supply. At least, you know, some of us, some of our supply. So, so that uh, works in our favor, but it, it, no, no question. These sorts of things, decisions complicate a whole bunch of stuff and and we happen to be heavily export dependent on on china in a big way so that's a concern no question yeah it's it's i've been saying since it happened that you know for a lot of farmers they probably feel really conflicted on this i think you broke it down really well in terms of if i'm not if i don't my farmer hat on i'm like yes (laughs) and if i you know knowing that you know what i'm growing and selling is you know one of the big purchasers is that country I'm, you know, you're kind of like, do we have to? Well, I guess we. You know, you're a little bit more conflicted, right? It's, it's definitely sure. a tough yep. one for sure. Hey, it, it is, and yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, thank goodness for more crush plants being built in Western Canada. I mean, we're going to diversify markets that way. We've got more of a challenge with peas, I would say, and that's a longer term prospect. But over time. I think uh, there's room to expand use in, in North America as well, and and maybe some at some point India comes back into the market. So, you know, there, that's that's the answer is to have a diversified market, and and when when a country comes to buy, say, oh well, we're sold out. Wouldn't that be a great position to be in? Come next year, sort yeah, of thing. Absolutely. Hey, Corey, thanks so much for uh, joining us here today on the show. All the best to you getting that uh, final seed uh, in the ground here, and we'll chat with you a little bit later on in the growing season. Sounds excellent, Sean. Thanks for the call. When we come back on Real Ag Radio, we're going to finish up from Rapid Fire in British Columbia in Chilliwack, and we're also going to talk to Mike Weir from Pioneer Seeds Canada, talk about some of the things that Corey just commented on. You're listening to Real Ag Radio. It's the Farmer Rapid Fire, brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada. ABJ Agri-Products is North America's exclusive distributor for air bubble jets and easy jets. These sprayer nozzles reduce the number of driftable droplets and at the same time maintain a uniform droplet size, primarily between 300 and 400 micron, ensuring more even dispersion of your chemical products, providing reduced drift and increased plant coverage. Let us help improve your spraying operation by visiting abjagra.com. That's A-B-J-A-G-R-I dot com. Canola is more than just a pretty face in the prairie landscape. It's a big business, both here and around the world, that requires you to be informed and up-to-date on everything it takes to grow a successful crop. The Canola School on realagriculture.com has an expert library of video resources covering markets, agronomy, and more to help you grow a healthy and profitable canola crop. Visit canolaschool.com today. Brought to you by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. The Farmer Rapid Fire on Real Ag Radio is brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada. Make sure you go to pioneer.com slash Canada to find out more. And we take the Farmer Rapid Fire all the way to the West Coast. We're in Chilliwack, British Columbia, and we're talking to Kevin Bishop. Hey, Kevin, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, okay. So, hey, what's happening on the dairy farm here this week? Uh, We are uh, eyeballs deep in first cut silage. Oh, nice. It shows you how earlier Chilliwack is than some <laughs> some other areas. Uh, how how are some of those yields in that first cut? Um, average. Um, 
well, for us, it's average. It's probably be out, uh, uh, about four or five ton of dry matter per acre. And, and you get like what, five cuts a year? Two, five. Some of the aggressive people get five, maybe six. Uh, four is, is quite normal. Is more common. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. How, how have things been inside the dairy barn? Uh, things have been going quite well, actually. I uh, can't really complain too much. Uh, cows have been doing normal. Quite, uh, quite uh, just on cruise control, I guess you could say. Things yeah. have been going. Uh, and, a, and, a, and a fall without flooding was nice. Uh, yep. Yeah. And uh, actually, it's actually been quite a nice uh, winter. A little bit colder than normal, maybe. But... Um, not a lot of extra rain and have quite a bit of nice sunshine in the forecast for the next few weeks. So. Yeah. Are, are you still, are, are you still seen in the, the area there? Uh, like when I think of Chilliwack, I think of expensive land, uh, are, are land prices still continuing to be pretty steamy in those, those parts? Yeah. Um, is that we're kind of in a, we're in a funny, um, uh, time right now just with interest rates and, I know a couple of the large, like one large uh, nursery tree grower, like grow cedar trees. Um, they've quit buying land and a large, a large dairy has quit buying land. So there's a bunch of farms that are uh, now, well, dairy farms, land, whatever you want to call it, it's empty dairy barns, I guess, and, and dairy farms that want to retire that have been on the market now for like six months. It's, and we're just trying to find, like, nobody knows what the land value is because those two people, those two uh, big buyers are basically uh, left the real estate market now for the time being. So, yeah, everybody's trying to figure out what the actual uh, value price is yeah. right now. Expensive. Normally, it's in, uh, well, a good piece of land is probably still worth about $100,000 an acre. So. Yeah, wow. Jeez. Um, you, getting back to your 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 first cut there uh or do you run a pull type chopper or uh self-propelled uh well personally uh me i uh i have a custom uh, round baler guy come in okay yeah so we do all silage bales myself and then uh on my off-farm job which i'm actually in the field right now i'm raking um we have a, a big boss um chopper oh uh, we uh chop with so I, I think my, I haven't checked for a while, but Klaus still kind of has like the real leadership position in, in forage harvester choppers, don't they? Uh, yeah, I believe so. They're very strong in our area. And I know um, John Deere is making a lot of headway in uh, so, uh, self-propelled forage in, uh, in our, their new ground, but Klaus is pretty strong in our area. Yeah. 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 Um, now, uh, you're, you're cutting off alpha, but do you also have like, what, what else are you using for feed? Like, are you doing silage corn as well? Uh, yeah, no, we don't really grow alfalfa here. Um, uh, it's mostly, uh, orchard grass. Oh, sorry. And, and that, yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. It's okay. orchard grass. And, and, uh, we, um, we double crop our, um, silage corn with like a winter wheat and annual rye grass. Okay. So um, that's what we're doing right now, all in combination with first cut at the same time. So, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, grass, um, silage, hay, whatever, everybody does a little different. And then uh, corn silage is, is... Have you ever done, uh, I had a listener was emailing about, for their dairy, they're trying uh, triticale. Have, have you ever done any of that? Uh, it is, uh, some, uh, some seed companies with the cover, we call it cover crop, the winter wheat, annual ryegrass. It has a percentage of triticale in it as well. Yeah. Yeah. So not, I haven't done it straight. So. Okay. Okay. Are you feeling pretty optimistic about the year ahead? Uh, yes. Yes. If we have normal weather, it's not too dry and not too, flooding. if we just have a normal year, if we get heat dome again or we get drought, then um, there's going to be, uh, we're going to be in a really tough situation. Mm. Yeah, like that in, that intense, intense heat in that la- latter part of June into July and August. That that heat dome, like you're, you're yeah, in an like, area where it gets hot. 
Yeah, we had, well, it all started in 21, June of 21 with the heat dome, and then we had the flood in November, and then we had a really dry summer fall in 22. The crops have been below average for the last two years. So we just, we just want a normal year is all I'm asking. So. Yeah, there's there's a lot to that. Hey, Kevin, thanks so much for joining us here this week on the Farmer Rapid Fire. All the best team. We'll chat with you again soon, okay? Perfect. Sounds good, Tom. Thanks. And we finish off the Farmer Rapid Fire this week as we have been talking to our show sponsor. It is Pioneer Seeds Canada. And today we're talking to one of Pioneer Seeds Canada's sales agronomists, this time from Manitoba, and it is Mike Weir. Hey, Mike, welcome back to the show. Crazy to chat with you. Yeah, you as well. Busy time. I, I am sure that you have got a lot of customers that are kicking their into high gear here, trying to get some, trying to put those plans into action. Well, absolutely. It's uh, as you mentioned, plans were put in place, and sometimes plans are meant to be broken. But right now, um, there's a there's a lot of people that are getting out into the field and getting some seed in the ground, and and with that comes a lot of questions around. You know what? What insects we're dealing with these days? Some some early season weed control, whether it's pre-emerge or early season end crop, and and then just your typical questions we get this time of year around seeding depth and, and soil temperatures. Now, in in Manitoba, where you are right now, is there is there a lot of seeding action going on? Yeah, we've been. Yeah, there's. It's, I wouldn't say the the pedal to the metal yet. Just with some of the the weather systems we've had come through here in the last week. Um, but yeah, I I think once. Uh, you know, if the sun shines for a couple of days, I, th- I think in most areas of the province, uh, most growers should should hopefully be, be out in the field and either putting some fertilizer down or getting some seed in the ground. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you mentioned insects. We, we were just talking to Corey Leeson earlier here on the show, farmer from Radisson, Saskatchewan. And uh, I was asking him things I should ask you. And one of the things he brought up was, you know, just strategies to deal with, you know, they're seeing more striped flea beetles where he is. And, you know, the flea beetles are a major concern across the prairies. Uh, it's just not a localized issue, but just trying to find the right solutions, right? Like, and there's obviously the seed treatment side, but there's also some of the practices, things that you can do to try to help yourself. It's just, it's, it's not perfect at this point, right? Well, yeah, yeah. It's been a, it's been quite a, Quite a few years here now we've been dealing with with striped flea beetles and in some areas the crucifer flea beetles as well and and uh, you know some of the springs we've had here whether we've had to chase moisture a bit where where a canola seedling gets out of the ground and it it just sits there for a while and very vulnerable to uh, particularly striped flea beetle that do do a lot of pitting and feeding on on small leaves and cotyledons but they also do quite a bit of, of stem feeding as well so you know it's seed company like uh, Pioneer and with the muscle of the research team at Corteva, we're, we're well aware of these challenges and and with that, try to combat things as, as far as developing new seed treatments and, and I know our research group are, are probably actively working at solutions there but currently available right now, we have some 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 strong flea beetle treatment options like topping things up with Lumiderm and and then on top of that, we have, we have really strong early season um, bigger in our genetics, which helps helps that canola plant battle through some of that early season flea beetle pressure. Um, some other things that we do see with the striped flea beetle is, as I mentioned, the, the stem feeding, which can become some some infection sites for for other early season diseases like black legs. So uh, this year, commercially available, we'll have Lumisend on our on our canola seed as well, which will, will which will help combat some of that early season black leg pressure. Are, are some of your customers talking about pushing back seeding dates to, or is that some more talk than action? What, do, what are you hearing from people? So that's another, another uh, conversation that, that's had, right? Like the sooner we can get that, that seed germinated and out of the ground, the longer duration we should have for that seed treatment protection. And, and uh, you know, in theory, the later you go into spring, the warmer the soil and, and, uh, and the air temperature which, which helps with that. Um, so there has been talk on, on using that as a strategy, but there's been years, uh, you know, I'll talk to Manitoba last year where we had some delayed seeding even into late part of May into, into June where we still saw some significant flea beetle pressure, even with some of that late seeded, seeded canola. So I would agree with your, your comments that, you know, waiting, 
waiting a couple weeks and going a little bit further into the spring to make sure we have that warm soil temperature and, and air temperature to get the seed out of the ground, uh, get the full advantage of that seed treatment coverage on that uh, on that canola seedling. That that will be another added uh, strategy that you can use to combat uh, well striped flea beetle, flea beetle, but also crucifer flea beetle. Yeah, yeah. Just and then you just kind of cross your fingers that you don't you don't get some untimely, really warm weather during the flowering period there's like in a, it, this is the the balancing act of trying to make these decisions that you know in hindsight are super easy and at the time they're they're challenging so it's 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 not to uh make it a late decision at all the the other well, thing yo sorry go ahead go ahead yeah i know your comments are bang on like if farming is is uh you know we i talked about those plans we put in place but a lot of those plans are at the mercy of mother nature right so it's it's uh we want to make the best decisions or educated decision in the spring to get the crop in the ground and off to the best start. And then, and then see from there what the season will bring. One of the other things, Mike, I, I, I know it's been coming up in your territory. You know, Corey Leeson mentioned it too, verticillium. This is one that a lot of canola growers are having to educate themselves on. Uh, what, what do we need to be on the lookout for here? Yeah. So it's, we look at verticillium and canola being the new kid on the block, but really it's, been around for for a number of years now where we've it was first confirmed obviously south of, of winnipeg and and uh, since there we've been since then we've been uh we're trying to observe this disease and and distribution across uh, western canada on where where it's being found and um and what we've seen is it's quite distributed across western canada so some some things that we learned on a high pressure year last year is crop rotation, like any disease, is a, is a, has a major impact on the severity of, of verticillium. Um, we also saw that, you know, I mentioned black leg with flea beetles. The black leg and verticillium, they're, they're kind of the one two punch when they start attacking a canola plant. So, generally, if you have verticillium and you get black leg infection in there, it's, it's a bit of a double whammy on, on the impact it has on that canola plant. So, one of the strategies strategies we've been talking about with growers is doing everything you can to limit the amount of black leg that you get within your canola and that you know that in turn will help help limit the impact that verticillium might have on your canola crop as well so going into this time of year i guess the, the comments or the questions that we're getting is how what can we do right now and uh, crop rotation making sure we have that top of mind having you know having genetics that are strong against black leg um, will help you as well with the severity of verticillium infection later in the season. Um, just another, you know, manage another added stress that could be on that canola plant. And then from a verticillium side, we're we're gaining a lot of uh, data points and info on how our our genetics ha- handle verticillium stripe um, within our our genetics and our lineup. So we we are at a point now where we can't put a rating on our on our hybrids that we commercially sell to growers. So. Um, you know, if you have seen verticillium in your in your on a field or on your farm, um, keeping in mind on crop rotation, managing black leg the best way you can, and then and then having a look at uh, some of the info that we've been able to glean on our current canola hybrids on on the way they can handle verticillium pressure. Going forward, I think you know you look at other other diseases we've had in the canola industry, like like club root when it was first found in Alberta, and and then black leg as well. You know you. We get behind it with that muscle of the research and development team at Corteva. Um, give them a bit of time, and they'll, you know, they're they're hard at work finding some solutions from the genetic standpoint to tackle diseases like verticillium. Well, hey, Mike, thanks so much for joining us here today on the show. Really do appreciate it, and I know we'll be talking to you later on in the growing season. So uh, look forward to that. Yeah, always great to chat with you, Sean. That's great stuff there from Mike Weir of Pioneer Seeds Canada. So we heard from our farmers that, yeah, they, there seems to be a lot of support for the Canadian government basically making a decision, a, a diplomatic decision on what to do with uh, the, the Chinese ambassador related to some of that interference and some of the dangers to Michael Chong's family. So uh, tell me what you think about it. You can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. Or of course, you can find us across all the different social media platforms. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And uh, you can also call the Real Ag Feedback line, 855-776-6147. 
Big shout out to Pioneer Seeds Canada for being the sponsor of the Farmer Rapid Fire. Much appreciated. So make sure you check out pioneer.com slash Canada for information on all their products and technologies they have for your farm. Thanks, everybody, for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Radio. And we'll, of course, chat again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Thank you for downloading this episode of Real Ag Radio brought to you by Ag Expert. Go from field to farm with Canada's most trusted, most secure farm management software. Ag Expert keeps you on top of it all, no matter where you are. Get started for free at agexpert.ca.